Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. Today is episode 46, I think, and it's the first time we're really getting into the topic of nuclear fusion, which I'm super interested in. To do that, I have Robin Langtree here with me. He's the CEO and founder of Avalanche Energy. I don't think I need to say much about why this is an important topic. Fusion has the potential to generate super abundant and cheap clean energy. I think the question is more whether we can do it on a meaningful scale quickly enough to save the planet and what the right path is to get there. Robin and Avalanche are taking an unconventional approach to fusion with relatively very small reactors about the size of a microwave. We'll talk more in a bit about why they've chosen that strategy, but to introduce Robin quickly, his background is in aerospace engineering and CFD or computational fluid dynamics and he has a PhD in mechanical engineering. Before setting out to provide the world with limitless clean energy, he worked at Blue Origin for about six years, a company with a mission to enable millions of people to live and work in space. So he's clearly a guy not afraid to tackle really gnarly technical problems with game-changing potential. Robin, thanks so much for being here. Dylan, thanks for having me. That was a really awesome intro. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to get into this. Where I thought we'd start is I find it really fascinating how many people I meet who have come to climate tech from the space industry. So I want to know for you, how did that journey start? How did you get into space exploration initially? Yeah, so I'd always been really inspired by sci-fi growing up as a kid. I used to read just so many books on science fiction growing up. I actually wanted to be a pilot early on in my career. And then um, decided I should go to school and get an aerospace engineering degree because that would help with that. And then September 11th happened and the aviation industry really went through a, a rough period. And I thought, well, maybe I'll stay for grad school. <laughs> and maybe I'll do a master's. Mm -hmm. And then a master's turned into a PhD. And so I ended up getting a PhD in aerodynamics in a field called turbulence modeling, which is trying to model like flow over wings and turbines and stuff like that. And then that turned into a role at Boeing, and I was at Boeing for eight, nine years. And I just felt like something was missing. Aviation is a very mature industry, and you're chasing sort of 1% or 2% improvements. And I just felt like that whole industry was sort of complete. And I wanted to do something more exciting, more along sci-fi routes. And so then I found out there's this space company south of Seattle that no one had heard of at the time called Blue Origin. It was building like a reusable rocket. And there was this billionaire, Jeff Bezos, that was going to like ride on top of it into space. And I was <laughs> like, now that is a really cool, uh, that's a really cool mission and a really cool company. I want to go do that. And so <laughs> I managed to get a tour there and it was wild. They're like in the suburbs south of Seattle called Kent. And they're like literally building rockets on the factory floor and rocket engines. And it was like engineer Disneyland. It was amazing. <laughs> and I ended up getting a job there. And very quickly, early on, ended up on the team, the architecture team that was like 10 people at the time that was trying to figure out how to build a orbital class reusable rocket, which is New Glenn, which is a year or two away from flying now. So I was on that team super early when it was like 10 people. and We were sort of writing six page Amazon style memos to Jeff every week on like the design and the architecture of that rocket and how we were going to figure out how to do this whole crazy thing. Because it's like the size of the Statue of Liberty. It has to fly to space and they come back and land. So that's kind of how I got into it. And it's been a really wild and really amazing experience since. Yeah, I was really intrigued by your last position at Blue Origin, at least as it's listed on LinkedIn. It just says advanced concepts and that you're working on super cool stuff. Yes. I've, you know, between you and me, can you say anything about what kinds of things you were working on? Well, keep in mind that was three, four years ago now. So I've been doing fusion for the past three years. But yeah, that was sort of the incubator for what would come after New Glenn. So once you had this reusable giant rocket, what was Blue Origin going to do next? And you're starting to see some stuff spool out from that those things. So for example, they're working on some concepts for commercial space stations. 
They're working on a lander for the moon. They're working at, you know, how do you go to the moon and use the resources in situ and build sort of a whole economy in space. And so I was on that advanced concepts team when I think it was about 50 or 60 people. And they were starting sort of those early projects that you're starting to see more of become public. And there's a lot of stuff that isn't public that you're going to start seeing coming out over the next five, 10 years too. So that was a really cool, it was a really, really cool place to kind of finish my space career, if you will, and move on to Fusion after that. I did want to touch on one more thing from your time at Blue Origin, which is the new Shepard landing. I looked it up on YouTube and it's just this incredible video because you can feel so much energy and excitement in the room and in the crowd of people outside the room watching. You mentioned this when we first met, but we didn't have time to get into the details. So what's the story there? Were you there for that? I was. So I started at Blue Origin a few months before then and was really just sort of like trying to find my bearings at the company and stuff like that. And so that mission where New Shepard landed for the first time was like the first time I'd ever got to be like part of or see a rocket launch. And so if you look at the video of the room, so we're all in this great room at Blue Origin watching the live feed from the rocket. And so if you look at it, you can see me in the upper left corner kind of standing against the wall, probably with this like puzzled look on my face, like what the hell is going on here? This is wild. And it was really this like magical experience because you're in the room with like 500 people that had been working like long night, long days, long nights for like two years to build this vehicle. The first one had crashed. This was their second go at it. And I don't think anybody really knows this, but there was like an issue with the avionics where the rocket was actually 60 or 70 feet lower than it thought it was. And so it the way they designed the landing trajectory, it lights the engines, it stops its downward motion, And then it looks at where it is relative to the pad. And if it's not over the pad, it does this sort of like sideways maneuver and then gets over the pad and then slowly comes down and touches on the pad. And so there was some issue with the avionics. So the rocket was actually like 60 feet lower than it thought it was. So it did this like crazy sideways maneuver. I don't know, like 20 feet above the ground or something. <laughs> so it looked like if you look at the video, it looks awesome because it's like basically going sideways, not very far above the ground. And it's like kicking up all this dust. And so in that room, all we could see was like the fire from the plume and the dust. And everyone in the room had thought like it touched down, but then tipped over and was on fire or something and that oh, they failed yet again. <laughs> and then the dust cleared. And this thing is like, standing on the pad totally intact and you can see the moment because everyone just kind of loses it and there's like middle-aged men jumping up and down and like hugging each other like it was a really wild moment it was really magical moment for me it was kind of like that was the moment where like i had like a pretty standard career up until that time and that was this moment where i was like okay like this is really like working on these really hard problems and then If you can solve them, if you can succeed, like this is really addictive. And it was almost like this religious, magical experience for me that like, if you can solve these really hard problems and they don't violate the laws of physics, like you should do it and you should try it. Because like, if you can succeed at it, it's like the greatest feeling you'll ever have in your entire career. And so that's kind of, for me, that I think a lot of people at Blue Origin and SpaceX, and I know myself, have been chasing that ever since. Like, let's do something really, really hard because the high you get if you can solve it is just the greatest feeling ever. Awesome. I'm also always surprised how my initial from the outside view of these space companies is that it's it's kind of about sending Jeff Bezos to space. That's cool. He has a lot of money to put towards that, but it actually feels like it is a pretty mission-oriented community. If we space has limitless resources, if we can tap into that, it actually can help us save the planet planet Earth. is Did that kind of side of it jive with you when you were there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm being a little bit fishy just and joking about flying a billionaire to space. I think the true mission of that company is really to like take industrial activities that are done on Earth and move them to space where they could be cleaner and really start to develop the space economy in near Earth orbit. So like if I'm using, and so I, I look at a lot of things through the prism of sort of sci-fi. And so one of the shows that I've always been really excited about or books is The Expanse. And so I would say like, if we're putting people into categories, like SpaceX would be the Martians. They're very much 
focused on Mars and trying to get to Mars and develop Mars. Okay. Whereas Blue Origin would be like the Earthers that are trying to like get to the moon and then develop the moon as like the hub of industrial activity, if you will. Okay, got it. So then what, I mean, it sounds like an amazing experience. What was the motivation to leave and start Avalanche? Yeah, so there was a couple things. So working on New Glenn, it's a giant rocket. What SpaceX is building, what Starship is even crazier and even bigger. It became really clear to me that even if we had giant chemical rockets, this vision of millions of people living and working in space was going to be super hard to do, even with huge chemical rockets and billions of dollars of capital, which means we need nuclear. And there's all these issues with launching nuclear fission reactors into space. And so that means it had to be fusion. So that's kind of what got me interested in fusion. I kind of did a mini self-directed PhD in fusion over a couple of years, just reading as much as I could get my hands on about it. And then the thing that really, really changed my perspective is like, most people don't know this, but we have these beautiful summers in Seattle. It basically stops raining around July 4th. Yeah, it's a secret. Yeah, it is a secret. You know it. It doesn't rain until like maybe end of September. And so you get these like three or four months where it literally is paradise on earth. It's just 72 and sunny every day. And then we started getting what people have referred to as fire season. So it happens in about August. And that's when you've gone sort of two months without it raining in the forest. And so the forests get really dry. And that always kind of happened. But now they get so dry that in the West that they're actually sort of catching on fire. And we're getting these massive wildfires and smoke. And so there's like two summers in a row where for like two or three weeks, you basically can't open your windows. You can't go running outside. You can't really go hiking. You can't do it. And so that is a big change. And that's something that has shown up in the past five or six years. And so for my co-founder, Brian and I, that was like a really existential, like the world is on fire, literally. And this climate change thing is real. And it's not going to do anybody any good if we're building an economy in space. It's like, Earth is on fire and you can't go outside because of wildfire smoke all the time. So that is what really flipped my perspective from space is super cool. We need fusion to do space to like, we really need fusion for climate. So I'd love to talk about fusion. Like I said, it's the first episode I focused on the topic. I read, it sounds like you've done a self-directed PhD by reading up on it or you did before starting. I have not gotten that deep. I would love to hear your explanation of what fusion is. And if you could dumb it down to the level of, say, a middling mechanical engineer turned amateur podcaster, that would be awesome. Yeah, no, I'll do my best. We're probably going to get better at this as we go. But so I find it helpful to think about fusion, nuclear fusion in the context of nuclear fission, which is what most people think about when they think of nuclear technology. And so you nuclear fission, right, was invented in the 1940s. And what you're doing is you're taking very heavy elements like sorry, uranium and plutonium and you're firing neutrons at them and you're splitting them. And when you split those heavy elements, it really, you know, one neutron might split a heavy uranium that releases two or three neutrons and those go on to split more uraniums. And so fission is a chain reaction of neutrons splitting really heavy elements. The issue with that is it's a chain reaction, so it can run away from you. So there's all kinds of layers of safety and systems of safety you have to put around a fission reactor to make sure it doesn't sort of run away from you. And then the other issue is you're splitting heavy elements. So some of those heavy elements are radioactive and some of them are radioactive for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. So that's where the nuclear waste, long-term nuclear waste issue comes from fission. Fusion is very much the opposite of fission. You're taking very light elements like isotopes of hydrogen or helium or sometimes just boron and shooting them at each other at very high energies, so high that when they collide, they actually fuse into larger molecules. And then those larger molecules release charged particles. And that's what actually you sort of capture and harness for energy. So typically they'll make a neutron or an alpha particle, which is just a helio, a charged helium without electrons. And those particles have a lot of energy and you can slow them down and convert those into heat and then do work with them. That's really what fusion is. It's combining very light elements into heavier elements and releasing energy and charged particles, or well, high energy particles. In the process. Yeah, it brings up so many questions for me. <laughs> I'm not sure where to go with it exactly. But at a high level, my understanding is you're generating more energy than you're consuming. 
That's the idea. In theory. Yeah. Yeah, right. No one has yet built a fusion reactor that made more energy out than it took to create. Now, the National Ignition Facility last Christmas did a really interesting experiment where they shot lasers at a target. And during the brief time where those lasers were heating that target, the energy that went into the target, there was more energy that came out from fusion that came in from the lasers. So that's what's called QSI or a their plasma made more energy out than it and went in. But the energy to make those lasers was far greater than what it took to what the amount of fusion energy. So it's not what we would call Q engineering greater than one, but it is a very interesting experiment that proved what's called ignition for the first time. So basically the plasma made more energy out than was put in to create it. So in theory, though, is the dream with fusion and is it feasible for fusion at some point to have fusion reactors that can plug into themselves, essentially they power themselves and generate? Is that kind of what we're getting at? Is that a feasible goal? Yeah, Okay. that is the goal. And so what I would call the Wright Brothers moment for fusion, the point where fusion is a technology that's going to be commercially relevant and it's imminent, is going to come when a fusion machine makes enough energy to run itself. Right. That's what I would call Q engineering greater than one. And that's what all of these startups and companies and labs are trying to get to as fast as we can. Because as soon as we have fusion machines that can run themselves, it's not that hard to scale from that to a fusion machine that makes it enough surplus energy that you can put it on the grid or do something useful for it. And so that is the ultimate goal of what everybody is really trying to get to is not a plasma that makes more energy, but an actual machine that makes more energy out than it takes to run it. So, Okay. And then as an engineer and just thinking about conservation of energy, how do you explain how something does that? That just seems to break the laws of physics. Not the actual mechanism that you already explained, but like heat pumps. 300%, 400% efficient. But the way they're doing that is they're actually moving heat. They're not generating heat, right? Yeah, totally, totally. Is there an explanation like that that makes this something you can wrap your head around? Yeah, totally. So I think what we're doing with fusion is we're really just using magnetic or electrostatic fields to confine plasmas. And plasma is just hot gases where the electrons have ripped off. And so you have ions and electrons at really high enough energies where this fusion effect will happen where the ions are colliding at such high energies that they're fusing, they're releasing more energy out than you put in to, to heat those ions. And so you have losses from that plasma, right? And so those come from particles leaking out of your fields. They come from X-ray radiation, like it's called Bremsstrahlung. Um, they come from Coulomb collisions, which causes like the ions to thermalize and scatter off each other. And so really what we're trying to do with fusion is engineer a plasma where the fusion energy out is greater than all those loss mechanisms that I talked about. And so if you can engineer your plasma using these magnetic and electrostatic fields so that the losses are less than the fusion out, then you have an interesting fusion device that you can use as an energy device. That's really what, at a fundamental level, everyone is trying to do with fusion. And so we have to live within the laws of physics. There's certain Coulomb collisions that happen at various ion energies, and you have to engineer your device to handle that. There's X-ray radiation that comes from the plasma. You have to engineer your device so that it's efficient enough to handle that. And then there's confinement, right? There's You can think of these fusion machines as like a bucket of water, but it's a leaky bucket of water. And so you need to plug the leaks as best as you can so that you can confine the water long enough to get something interesting, right? So you can confine the plasma long enough to get energy out. And so that's the laws of physics that we have to live in. And really what we're trying to do is engineer plasmas to do something interesting and useful, which is make net energy. Okay, so let's say we get to this Q engineering state with fusion. We have fusion reactors that can power themselves and we have very cheap, abundant, clean energy. What's the significance of that to the world? How does that change things? Yeah, so like right now we're in the process of doing all this sort of low-hanging fruit for clean energy, right? Like solar is scaling massively every year. Wind is scaling. We're electrifying the automobile industry, right? We're doing what I would call the low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff. Well, it's not easy, but it, relatively easy. <laughs> we are going to get to the point where 
there is no more long hanging fruit. And we're going to have to decarbonize really hard industries that require a lot of energy. Think about maritime shipping, long haul trucking. Those are huge industries that eventually will need to be decarbonized. And we don't have great solutions for how to do that. Aviation is another one. And so where fusion comes in is fusion is going to show up sort of at halftime. This is a football game analogy. Fusion is going to show up at halftime and help us get to the fourth quarter where we can fully decarbonize the economy. So right now, I would say we're in the first quarter, building out solar, building out wind, building out storage, trying to electrify the grid, trying to electrify transportation. But to get to the fourth quarter where we truly have a carbon-free economy and we're no longer increasing the temperature of the Earth with time, we're going to need things like fusion and fission and geothermal to really get all the way there. Oh, interesting. So you actually think, at least initially, of it as a way to decarbonize the hard-to-abate sectors, not something that would replace all other energy production. I, when I think, well, oh, we've got this free, <laughs> like limitless, clean energy, why not replace all solar and geothermal and everything else? Like It seems like a cheat, kind of, but that's not the path. You think it's more about these hard-to-abate industries? That's how I think Fusion. Fusion is a diverse community, and there's a lot of different opinions on how this is going to deploy and scale. My personal belief is that we're going to use Fusion first on the, because it's a new technology, right? And all new technologies start up high on the cost curve. And then as you perfect them and you mass produce them, you bring the cost down and you open up sort of the markets where business case closes. So I think Fusion is probably going to start off expensive. And so you're going to use it to address things that cheap sources of power like solar can't address right now. So think about communities up in the north where they don't have long days, right? You can't store energy for six months. That's not really how it works. So solar doesn't really work for those communities, but fusion certainly would because fusion is sort of a 24-hour base load power. And so, you know, if you want to decarbonize those type of places, you're going to have to do something else. And so that's why I talk about it in terms of low-hanging fruit. Like, yeah, if you're in California, rooftop solar, like, that totally makes sense. We should be doing as much of that as possible and, and pairing it up with storage and like trying to get as much carbon out of the grid as possible. But if you're up in Alaska, like it's not really going to work for you. And so you, there needs to be other solutions. And so if we want to get to net carbon zero, we're going to have to develop those technologies now so that they're ready to be deployed in 20 years, 10 years when we need them. Because we don't want the clean energy revolution to stall because all of a sudden it's too expensive to address these hard to decarbonize things. We want to have technologies that are ready to go to help decarbonize those things. Okay, that, that was going to be my next question is kind of what kind of time scale and, and do you believe it will happen in, in a time frame that's not too late? Yeah. You just said 10 or 20 years. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so I think right now the climate predictions have 2050 as being this like really critical time when we have to kind of get our emissions below a certain level. And so if you walk it back from 2050, you have to have massive technologies at scale in 2050. And so to be able to scale those technologies to massive levels, we really need to be starting to do that in 2030, mid, early to mid 2030, right? And so you walk that back to where we are now, it's like, okay, like we absolutely need to solve fusion in the next five to seven years in order to get into a spot where we're ready to scale those technologies and have prevent major climate impacts from becoming worse beyond 2050. So it's all, for me, it's just walking it backwards. It's like it has to happen in the next five to seven years. A lot of people have realized that. And that's why you're seeing so much investment go into fusion. I think, it's, I think we're at something like $6 billion of private investment into various fusion, private fusion companies. It's because there's this realization out there that we need technologies that are going to help get us from the halftime to the fourth quarter. And we need to develop them now. We needed them to develop them 10 years ago. Now we absolutely need them to come home in the next five to seven years. And it's an exciting time. You're seeing a lot of different companies pushing really, really hard to build those first fusion machines that are going to make more energy out than it takes to run them. And then once they do that, now you're at a point where you've de-risked the technology enough that you're ready to start bringing in some massive amount of capital to scale those things. And that's going to be really exciting too. Is that challenging as a startup to raise funds 
the typical VC model looks for kind of 10 year returns, but you're working on something that has potentially a longer time scale than that to have really big financial returns for the fusion industry generally. Has it been hard to navigate that? Yeah. So I've observed a really big shift in the past five years. So 20, circa 2018, 2019, like if you went to a VC and said, I want to do a hardware startup, possibly that has applications for defense and space and clean energy, the most likely answer you would get is like, no, like hard pass. <laughs> like, yes. And that has completely changed in the past three to four years. And so that's been a welcome change that hardware startups have become very, very interesting for the VC community. Clean energy has become very, very interesting for the VC community. So that has been a really, really helpful change. I'm not in the room with other fusion companies that pitch their plans and their startups. So I don't know how they're kind of going about talking about those timeframes. I do know for us, we're doing a very small fusion reactor. We think that early applications for what we're doing actually have a lot of applications for space and defense. So for us, the timeline to a meaningful commercial operation, once we kind of do the proof of physics, is actually not 10 to 15 years. It actually happens a lot quicker. So that's one thing that's really different for us is like we have some proof of physics. We have to like build our first machines and get to that Wright Brothers moment where it makes more energy out than it takes to run it. But once we do there, get there, after that, it's really engineering. And there's all these really interesting early applications like space power and propulsion or unmanned submersibles that are totally viable businesses for us that are not necessarily the case for like a big fusion power plant or something. So I think we have a different path um, to commercial viability and we can do it on a different, a shorter time frame is my hope than 15 years or something. Okay. I think that's probably a good segue into why you've chosen to focus on a small reactor. Yeah, so it's a very good question. So one of the things we learned working in new space is the importance of size. So if your rocket engine is like 10 feet tall and you look at the size of those components and those parts, you have a problem. There's probably like three companies in the whole country that could make castings for your turbo pump at that size, for example. If your rocket engine is three or four feet tall, that's more human size, that's more human scale. Now you have a massive supply chain. You can make all those parts in machine shops. You can get your castings done from a variety of supplies. It makes it a lot easier to build your early devices, prototype, test, fail, fix, learn from them. And so the thesis of Avalanche Energy when we set out to do this is we're going to do fusion, but it's going to be small. It's going to be human-sized. It's going to be no bigger than for example, a Merlin rocket engine at SpaceX. And the reason is because we want to be able to iterate on the hardware and take this sort of agile, test-fail-fix approach to future. And does that also drive different kind of applications and a different go-to-market strategy? That central decision drove us, took us basically off the path of where a lot of fusion R&D has happened into like a totally left field process. So we looked at what are the approaches to fusion that are out there that could scale down to the size we were talking about. Laser fusion, like what the National Ignition Facility is doing, no way. Super high magnetic fields, like Tokamax, like what Commonwealth Fusion Systems is doing, like no way. The only thing that we saw that could be the size of a Merlin rocket engine or smaller was to do electrostatic fusion. So use very high voltages to smash those ions together at fusion energies and confine them together. And so electrostatic fusion has been researched since the 50s and 60s, but it's always been very small teams of a few people working with very, very limited budgets, less than a million dollars, maybe a few million dollars in the 1990s. It's never received sort of the kind of mind share or resources that some of the other fusion approaches have taken. So we are very much starting out at an earlier phase with a lot more scientific and technical risk. But the advantage of what we're doing is it's so small that we can scale really quickly once we figure it out. And we can iterate on the hardware and we can learn really quickly. So we can build, you know, a fusion machine on the order of six weeks. We're actually building a third one right now. We kicked it off a few weeks ago. It should be done in January. So we can build these things really quickly. We can learn from them really quickly. And that's the advantage. But we have a lot more science and physics that we have to go figure out because we're just not working from that 
strong base of research for 50 years that like a tokamak or a laser fusion approach is. So there's pros and cons here. Our belief is that by going small, that's going to let us run really fast and use simulations and computers and all these modern approaches to figure out fusion at a really quick time scale. And you'll actually leapfrog because of the number of iterations and how quickly you'll be able to kind of progress the science, you'll actually leapfrog some of these other companies or approaches. That's the model we're using. We saw that work really, really well with SpaceX. When they started from very modest means, at the time they started, Russian rocket engines were considered the most high-performance, sophisticated rocket engines ever built. And there was all kinds of secret sauce and know-how that American rocket scientists didn't think they could ever reproduce. And in the process of iterating on Merlin, they were able to develop one of the highest performing rocket engines ever. And the reason is because it was small. They blew up a lot of rocket engines in McGregor, Texas. They learned a lot. And that is kind of the thing we're trying to do for fusion. We're very much trying to like channel that energy. Be small, test, fail, fix, go fast, learn fast, fail often. But if you learn from something that's good and you kind of run really fast and try and do that to develop it. Yeah, I love that. But Synapse, we're in product development and that that is such a key concept in hardware is prototype and test as much as possible. Every time you do that, you learn something and iterate. So just, it, I find it really interesting how you've organized your whole strategy to optimize for that. I think that's really cool. And just to put that into perspective, you can build a system in six weeks to iterate on one of these big tokamak systems that are, I don't know, the size of a office building or something. They're big. I imagine that's tens of millions of dollars and... I don't know, months of effort, or it's got to be a just sort of an order of magnitude difference. It depends on the machine. I mean, Inner has been going for 20 or 30 years, and we're just starting to kind of get the first prototype come together in France now. What Commonwealth Fusion Systems is doing with their tokamak, basically the secret there is they go to much higher magnetic fields, so that shrinks the size of the tokamak. So they're building Spark right now, and everyone in the Fusion community is really excited to kind of see that machine come online. And they're doing that, I think, here. I think CFS raised their Series A in 2018, about $100 million, which is huge for a first route. Mm-hmm. They raised uh, $2 billion, I believe it was about two years ago, to build Spark. And by all accounts, Spark is supposed to go online in 2025. So that's, what is that, like three, four years from getting the capital to building that first machine. If the iteration scale for a tokamak is three to four years, we're trying to be many orders of magnitude faster than that. Yeah. Right. And then do you think what you're doing is a path at some point down the road will want, I assume, kind of grid scale, megawatt scale reactors? Is what Avalanche is doing a path to that? Or do you think you'll always focus on these smaller power generation need applications? Yeah, so the area that we're focusing on is in the kilowatts to maybe a few hundred kilowatt range per fusion cell, if you will. We're doing electrostatic fusion. I'm not quite sure the approach we're taking would scale much beyond 100 kilowatts. But there is this analogy with a Tesla battery pack. If you've ever seen like how they make these battery packs, it isn't like a giant battery in the floor of the car. It's actually like the batteries they're making are about the size of like a D-cell battery, right? And they use mass production, factory scale production to build millions of these tiny little batteries. And then they integrate them all together into this big battery pack if you will. And that's how they actually get the cost out. And they use basically manufacturing at scale to do that. That's very much how we're thinking about doing fusion. So we have this fusion cell, let's say it makes 10 kilowatts of power or 100 kilowatts or whatever. We're going to mass produce these things in like a Tesla Giga style factory to get all the cost out. And then if you need a megawatt, you would put 10 of these 100 kilowatt units together. If you need 10 megawatts, then you would do 100 of them. That's very much how we're thinking we would scale. It's very much analogous to like an automotive factory to mass produce these things. And then you integrate them at the scale and size you want where you need it. So if you're a community up in Alaska and you need 10 megawatts, okay, we would put 100 of these 100 kilowatt units together in some sort of like containerized thing, and that would go power your town or whatever. And so it's very much a distributed energy vision of the future instead of a 500 megawatt gigawatt power plant with 
OLED grid wise running to it all over the place and stuff like that. It's very much a distributed future of energy. Okay. That seems to be a common thing I hear in climate tech too, is this kind of difference of approach of building lots of small things versus a small number of really big things. And it feels like high number of small things wins out like solar panels or so like we've proven you can scale the technology. We have manufacturing methods to kind of optimize for cost and everything. Yeah, it's very much, you know, once you get beyond a certain scale, you're not really a factory manufacturing project anymore. You're a civil engineering project, right? And so everything tends to be one off or you're buying five or 10 of these things. It just really increases your cost. Now you do get benefits of scale. And so it's always a competition between the benefit of being big and having scale, making a lot of something versus you're only making a few of it. And can you beat the business case by mass producing something really, really cheaply at scale where raw materials are coming in and you're getting and finished products out. So we'll see which approach wins. It's going to be a really mm-hmm. exciting 10 to 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think it's really important to have like a diversity of approaches to fusion, having a lot of shots on goal, a lot of different approaches, and we will let the market decide what is the best approach. I wanted to get a little bit more into the kind of technology and engineering side of it. Do you, you're an engineer, are there any problems that you've come up against so far there, or even that are on the horizon that you'd call out as like particularly interesting or gnarly challenges for engineers? So do you mean specifically with what we're doing or fusion in general? With what you're doing, yeah. doing, yeah. No, with developing the avalanche system. Yeah, so our approach, we're using very high voltages in a 12 centimeter diameter cylinder with a rod, a cathode in the middle. And we're shooting these ions in with an ion beam and capturing those ions into orbits. And where those orbits cross, it's very much like satellites orbiting the Earth. Where those trajectories cross, they cross at really high speeds. And so in our device, they're crossing at fusion energies. And so one of the early problems that we knew we were going to have to solve is how do we get this really high voltage in a really small package? So the physics says that we need to get to like 300 kilovolts in a 12 centimeter diameter cylinder to be sort of optimum for colliding deuterium tritium, which is the easiest fusion fuels to burn. And so the key cross section there is at 63 kilo electron volts. So those orbits are crossing at 63 keV. And for our device, we need to get to 300 kilovolts to hit those energies. And so that was one of the really early questions is like, can you put that high a voltage in vacuum without it arcing? Is that even going to be possible? And so that was one of the big early technical risks. We hired a really awesome high voltage PhD straight out of school and set them on that project. And it's at, that part of the project is going surprisingly well. So we just hit 248 kilovolts in our lab a few weeks ago on our way to 300. We're almost there. So that has surprised me because I thought that was going to be the really, really hard problem we were going to have to tackle. The one that has turned out to be, there's always unknown unknowns with these projects. If you're building a rocket engine, there's certain things that are going to show up. Often it's a combustion instability or something like that. And so the question we've been asking is like, what are the unknown unknowns about our electrostatic approach to fusion? What do we not know about that's going to rear its ugly head and be this like really hard technical problem to solve. And so the one that's turning out to be the really hard thing is shooting the beam in and getting that beam captured in such a way where it isn't skimming the walls and you're losing your ions every orbit, where that has turned out to be like the really hard problem. We have a big team and a bunch of people working on different approaches to like shoot those ions in and capture them into fusion. So there's like multiple paths to success. I don't know which one is going to win out, but we're basically taking the problem. We've broken it out into like, parallel tracks, like this team is doing this, this team's doing that, this team's doing that. It's part of the reason we decided to build a third fusion machine is we're like, okay, if we're going to break this problem into multiple approaches, we needed a third machine to test these ideas on. We had a big meeting. We said, okay, here's the ideas that we would test on this one. Does everybody agree? All right, let's go do it. And so six weeks later, hopefully this thing is going to show up and it's going to be the test bed for it. So Definitely ion loading has been the unknown unknown that showed up that is turning out to be like the really difficult problem. But if we can solve that one, we are very well positioned to kind of scale up fusion rates and the density and and really make a run at it. How do you decide when to prototype and test versus simulate model something like that? Yeah, this is a good question. So the ideal scenario is you start with analysis, you simulate it, 
and then you build it, you test it, and you validate your analysis and your simulations. There's times where you have to skip those steps because the analysis is really complicated or the simulation codes just are not capable of simulating the thing you need to do. And so that's when you got to jump straight to test. And that's kind of scary because you're like, right, you're trying to do your best, but like, there's only so much you can understand about how the machine runs. And so we very much try and break these problems into like analysis, simulation, test and validate if we can. But there are going to be scenarios where we have to go straight to test. And then what you're doing is you're building diagnostics to understand as best as you can the physics of what's going on in your thing and validate your ideas or your analysis as much as you can. So to answer your question, it's very much a judgment call. It's very case specific. If we have the option of doing an analysis or a simulation, we'll always kind of default to doing that because that's something you can do in like a day or two or maybe a week. Whereas building a machine is still a major commitment. We're 35 people right now. It takes sort of a, at a bare minimum, it takes like an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, a plasma physicist to kind of run a machine. And so that's a commitment of headcount that has to go into doing that. So we don't take those decisions lightly. But in this case, like ion loading is becoming like the number one thing we have to solve. And so we need more shots on goal, just like we need more fusion concepts out there. And so we're going to go build a third test machine and go explore some of those alternate concepts. And with these prototypes, it sounds like you're really kind of pushing the boundaries of physics and plasma and super high voltages and stuff. What happens when things go wrong? Are there, do you have safety concerns, catastrophic failures? What does that look like? Yeah, fusion is basically plasma in a vacuum. In terms of like what can fail, well, if something overheats and you break your vacuum, air leaks in and the whole thing shuts down. It's pretty benign from that standpoint. It's not like a rocket engine where you if something fails, it explodes like spectacularly. Right. <laughs> Our things will tend to implode. And so then it's like a problem because you're going to like clean it up, but it's not like a catastrophic okay. failure. Mechanism, yeah. Right. We do have to worry about radiation, x rays, neutrons. And so we monitor what the machines are shielded. And then we monitor what radiation is coming off those machines very closely. And so if the radiation is starting to get above the hard limits we've set, we'll stop and we'll shut down. We'll figure out what's going on. So the two safety things are really like something overheats and melts. And we have melted some fusion machines. I've got some pretty crazy pictures I've shown investors of a melted cathode that's like half hanging there and stuff like that. <laughs> that was fun. But for the most part, it's really just thermal vacuum and radiation that we have to worry about. We're very, very careful about monitoring all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the future a bit. And something when you and I first met, you had mentioned this concept of superabundance and how that can, what the significance of that is on humanity. I'd love to hit on that a little bit because I just, as we close out, I want to think about where is Avalanche going? Where is the industry going? And I thought that concept of superabundance was really interesting. Oh, yeah. So if you think about it, like energy is really at the root of economic development and inflation even, right? If you have high energy costs, you have high inflation. And so superabundance is this idea that if we have fusion reactors that are deployable, mass produced, and the energy they produce is low cost, we can really solve energy as sort of a limitation on the economic growth of humanity. There's a really great example of how superabundance can solve of a lot of the conflict in the world. And so that's Ireland, where my ancestors came from. So for hundreds of years, there has been strife and violence on the island of Ireland between Catholics and Protestants. And the original Langtrees that immigrated to Canada was an Anglican and a Catholic. And I'm sure that was uh, part of the reason they <laughs> left. And so if you think about, well, what happened in Ireland in the 1990s that just made all that kind of go away, it was the European Union and all the economic development that came with that. And so all of a sudden, everyone got so rich on the island of Ireland that all those generational conflicts between Catholics and Protestants just kind of faded away. Like, why are you going to go fight with the town down the road when you've got your Spanish vacation in August coming up? It just, <laughs> all those things don't matter if everyone is growing and abundant. People are focused more right. on building their families and their communities than fighting each other over constrained resources. And so I think that's a really good mental framework for what could happen in the world if we have fusion and super abundant energy and economic development. Like a lot of these conflicts that seem intractable, like think about in the current news cycle, 
you know, the Middle East, like Israel and Palestine, they're fighting over strips of land, arable land beside the Mediterranean. Well, what would happen if we had super abundant fusion and we could develop parts of the desert that are currently unlivable? Like, I think a lot about things in ter- from the framework of sci-fi. And so like a lot of places in Jordan kind of look like Tatooine from Star Wars. Yeah. Like, what was Luke Skywalker even doing out in the desert anyway? They were moisture farmers, right? They were <laughs> mining water from the air using fusion reactors and then selling it. And so imagine a future where we have all these 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt fusion reactors in a container paired with a moisture farmer. It provides your family or your settlement with electricity, water, and air conditioning. Like, you can basically live anywhere in the world. We could basically live in the desert. We could turn the desert into a garden if you wanted to. And so that's the type of future I envision where we have small-scale fusion that's widely deployed and very, very affordable for anyone who wants one. And I think if we can create this scenario where people can kind of live anywhere and aren't resource constrained, just like the island of Ireland, a lot of those conflicts will just fade into the past. And there'll be things that people talk about their grandparents or their forefathers fought over, but it won't be relevant to the here and now because everyone's so busy growing their families and their communities and living well. And that's what we can have if we have super abundant fusion energy. That's the future I would love to try and be a part of if I can. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's, yeah, that helps me wrap my head around it a little more. Like it, this is a technology that is not dependent on natural resources around you or geography, geology. Like it, it's just, and it could be deployed anywhere in the world, which makes it supports energy independence for anyone. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's free. I mean, once we get to that queue, <laughs> I guess that there's like CapEx to build the systems. and I mean, there's raw materials that go into it. Right? Yeah. So it'll always be some sort of multiple on top of the raw materials. But there isn't anything in a fusion reactor that is like so exotic that you would see like wars or like strategic competition happening over them. It's not like fusion reactors are going to be made out of gold or something that's like very, very limited. Like these are standard engineering materials and the hydrogen and deuterium are abundant, you can breed the tritium. And there's other fusion fuels that are really interesting too, like proton boron, which is widely, widely done. Like boron is used in tank armor. It's super abundant. If we can crack fusion and then we can do it in a way that scales, especially to the alternative fuels, like there's no limit on how much we could deploy this. And so that's why it's really interesting in terms of talking about super abundance and, and what that could mean for the world. I really do think a lot of conflict over resources, which really are energy conflicts at the root cause of it, can be solved if we have super clean, abundant fusion. That's crazy to think about. Awesome. I guess reaching that will be a similar feeling to that New Shepard landing moment, right? That'll be Q energy, right? That'll be that yeah. brother's moment. Well, so there's a couple miracles that we have to solve along the way to the Q energy thing. But yeah, the Q energy thing will be like that New Shepard landing thing for me. That'll be like, The moment where, like, holy smokes, we did something really hard and really impactful and really amazing. I'm really excited to try and do that the next couple of years. Cool. Well, I'm excited for you. That's amazing. Okay. How about I hit the last few questions and then we can wrap up? Cool. Okay. All right. I have three questions to close this out that I ask everybody. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of our planet and why? That's a good question. I think in the short to medium term, I'm actually pessimistic, but in the long term, I'm very optimistic. So I think what you are going to see, unfortunately, over the next five to 15 years is a lot more scarcity in terms of energy, water, a lot more conflict associated with that. And we're kind of seeing it already. It feels like the world is a much more dangerous, chaotic place now than it was 10 years ago. And I suspect Inflation, which is basically tied to energy and water scarcity, is a big part of that. So I think you are unfortunately going to see more conflicts in the next 10, 15 years. You're going to see a lot more immigration from areas that are resource poor to richer areas. And I think that's going to create a lot of conflict. I am a technological optimist at heart, though. I believe that we can actually invent 
a lot of the technologies that will solve that. I think Fusion is part of that. And that's why I'm working on it. And so longer term, I'm actually super optimistic that we are going to solve climate change. We are going to build a super abundant economy. And the standard of living for humanity has increased dramatically over the past 200 years. I think we're going to see that continue for another couple hundred years. So I think once we invent fusion, we are going to be building ever better fusion reactors for the next couple hundred years. And I think you're going to see like a big renaissance type effect associated with that. So having clean, having being able to create water and electricity anywhere on the planet and do it super abundance, I think is going to be like a huge benefit for humanity long term. Who is one other person or company doing something to address climate change right now that's inspiring you? So in the current culture, the current news cycle, I'm going to pick someone that is somewhat controversial, but I'm going to say that Elon Musk is the person that inspires me the most. And there's two very good reasons for that. So the first one is Tesla. It's a long tunnel, but there is a light at the end of it. We are in the process of electrifying the entire automobile industry in the country and in the world. And Tesla is at the root of that. Tesla made electric vehicles cool when nobody wanted them. Tesla solved the sort of infrastructure problem of supercharging. If you've ever tried to like charge like a Ford Mustang, a Ford E-Mustang or something like that, it's not a pretty experience. A lot of those chargers that are sort of not Tesla chargers, like sometimes they're not, you show up and they're not maintained or they have the wrong software. They can't talk to your car. Like it's kind of ugly. And I think Tesla did a lot of the blood, sweat, and tears, the really hard work over the past 10 years to create the ability where people want to buy electric vehicles and you can actually see them being useful for most people in their daily lives. So I don't think Elon gets a lot of credit for that in the current culture that we're in, but he should because he's created something really awesome. And we would not be nearly as far as we are in terms of electrifying the automobile industry without Tesla. The second major reason it's Elon, is that through Tesla, through SpaceX and his other companies, he has inspired a generation of scientists and engineers to go tackle really hard problems and to go do hardware, not just mobile apps on mobile phones and stuff, but to actually do real hard hardware startups and hard problems. And so I think I would not be doing Fusion if it wasn't for sort of the inspirational work that Elon did at SpaceX with Starship and reusable rockets and stuff like that. I think people kind of forget how fast the world has changed. So it's 2023. If you went back to 2013 and pulled the experts at NASA, would we be flying reusable rockets on a weekly basis? The answer would be most definitely no. And only 10 years later, like this is the reality we live in. And that is SpaceX and that is Elon. I have to give him kudos. He has pushed us towards electrification way faster than I think anyone thought was possible. And he's taught a generation of scientists and engineers how to dream big and do big, hard problems. And I think we owe him a debt of gratitude for that, for sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's You can't ignore the impact he's had despite how controversial he is. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate tech today who wants to do something to help? I would say it's not too late for you. There's still time for you. I've had multiple career pivots. I went from this really weird field of turbulence modeling to working on aviation, to working on reusable rockets and now fusion. If you want to do something, pick up a book, read a paper. I'm a firm believer that you can do anything you want if you're willing to put in the time and do the work to do that. So I would say if you want to be part of climate or you want to be part of a hardware, you know, a company and you don't have the skills to get in there, fix it. Do another degree, read, whatever. Become an expert in the thing you want to do and then go do it. It's there's always time. I love it. And you're a great example of that. Thanks a lot, Robin. I've learned a ton chatting with you so. and really inspired by what you're doing. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Dylan. I really appreciate having me on the pod. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.